Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to EDNA. And uh, we're going to hopefully be efficient with our time and get in and out of here before the inclement weather gets upon us today. So we will open up uh, the hearing on House Bill 1080. And uh, are you going to introduce? Uh, or is Rep. Leckes here? Well, come on up here, here. <laughs> good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning to the committee. Um, Jody Nelson, I represent Rockingham 13 in Derry, and I am the legislative co-chair of the Legislative Youth Advisory Council. I was appointed last March, and I have been... Um, it, I've had the most amazing experience with this group of future leaders. Uh, they do important work for themselves and, and expressing um, what is of concern and, and interest and giving insight as young people into bills um, that, of, uh, that they study and ask questions about and testify to or write recommendations for or against. And I think also very importantly as well, um, these young leaders, future leaders and present leaders are learning how to debate amongst themselves in a respectful manner, even if they disagree, which I think is much needed in, in, our, um, in our society nowadays. So um, that being said, uh, in the past few years um, during the pandemic and post pandemic, the council was kind of limping along a little bit. And under the leadership of our amazing uh, youth co-chair, um, it's come alive again. Um, there are many, many bills that have been um, discussed and recommended and not recommended. And uh, the James Tebalt, who is the youth co-chair, and I um, talked about um, looking at present RSA and how it could be adapted and changed um, to um, better suit um, the needs of the council and also um, giving a little bit more structure to when we pass the torch onto the next council that there would be more continuity. So we um, submitted a bill. Uh, this is uh, as amended by um, Chairman Hill's committee. And they gave us the grace of actually, during a really busy time of year for all of us, of having a subcommittee. And I really appreciate the commitment of those people on the subcommittee. They um, offered this amendment, um, keeping some of um, our suggestions, leaving some of the RSA intact, and also providing um, some really interesting and I think helpful um, direction in here, um, feeding off of um, some people's past experiences with the council and also just of a different lens in general. Um, so I am in full support, full support of this amendment. I think it will be great to try out um, for next year. And um, I guess that's all that I really uh, need to say about it. Thank you for your testimony. Questions from the committee? Senator Altshuler, sorry. <clears throat> Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative, for taking my question. I was uh, co-chair with you for a hot minute until I got moved to another, um, <laughs> uh, another committee. Um, so between um, the original legislation and what's come out amended by the House, the original legislation um, does say that the Legislative Youth Advisory Council is established to and is established to examine issues of importance to youth, such as education, employment, strategies to increase youth participation in local and state government, safe environments for youth, substance abuse, emotional and physical health, foster care, poverty, homelessness and youth access to state and local services. Um, 
And this new one says the focus shall be to identify legislation that affects youth in the areas of education, science and technology, transportation, labor and substance misuse. So it is a divergence from the original intention of the establishment of the Youth Advisory Council. And given that the ages are, half of the students are under the age of voting and half are able to vote, um, what, what was the thought behind removing anything that has to do with um, youth, increasing youth participation in lo local and state government? Thank you uh, for the question, um, Senator Altschiller. My understanding when I spoke with the subcommittee and the chair regarding um, this very question that you asked, um, it's that they felt like there was a very broad, um, um, broad um, choice of subject matter, and they wanted to kind of um, cut that down a bit to um, see if their focus of the council could, um, could, you know, the count, I'm sorry, I'm not explaining myself very well. The, the council could be more focused on these certain areas. And I agreed to trying it out next year. I am um, hopefully going to remain on the council. And I uh, mentioned to the members of the council that if we feel that it is too limited, that I would be happy to go back and ask the House Committee to tweak that part a little bit. Uh, yeah, uh, just uh, uh, one one last question, follow up question. This uh, the original legislation is um, is pretty concise and this goes even further than the governor's legislative council youth council on drug and alcohol abuse like this is way way beyond what the governor's youth council does it seems like this is a um this is really constrictive to letting students have the opportunity to participate at this level and interact with their representatives and senators in a meaningful way when they are prescribed a certain amount of activities rather than being suggested of like you could choose to do this, 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 or this, depending on the circumstances of the legislature at the time or the uh, topics of the day. Um, and so, I'm just curious as to why there was a push to make this so dense and, and, and restrictive. Thank you for the question, Senator. Point taken, and I, I, I don't have the answer for you. Um, I specifically don't know exactly um, why that was chosen, other than I did get feedback that um, they wanted to um, you know, concentrate the focus a little bit more. Um, and other than that, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know the exact answer. Um, One more follow-up. When you say they, was it the subcommittee uh, wanting to concentrate it, or the present students? I'm so sorry to no interrupt words. you. No, no, no. We're, we're talking. We're talking. <laughs> um, it was the subcommittee and then the committee unanimously voted in favor. I got it. Further questions? Sorry. Right, seeing none. Thank you. What, did you have more to add? I'm so sorry. I did have one more um, point um, that I wanted to address with you. And this was, um, I thought this was a very good idea and included in the amendment. Um, I think Senator Alshaler might understand this, um, even being on, on the committee for the short time that you are. It, this, um, being a legislative co-chair, is um, a great responsibility for this council and for one person to um, be able to take it on and do it well is a, a giant feat. Um, there are, are, there are uh, things that I w wish that I had time and experiences, more experiences that I wish that I could provide um, the members of this council. I just, my bandwidth is not there. And 
I thought it was a really great idea to have two legislative co-chairs from the House, one from uh, the Republican side and one from uh, the Democrat side, and have them be um, younger or the youngest um, members of the House and have a uh, an advisor uh, person from the House um, be able to obviously offer them advice because, you know, it's very overwhelming being a freshman and also being a young person. I just think that um, with that um, expand, expanding that role to two, two legislative co-chairs, particularly because they have um, differing opinions on subjects sometimes, uh, and also that they are closer in age to these um, members of the council, and I think that they would be able to offer something that I could not offer in, in the sense of time and also being relatable. And that's all that I wanted to add as well. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a break just for a minute because we have some special guests that are coming into the room. <laughs> come on in. You guys, you guys can come right around if you want. Actually, why don't you guys come right around here, Brian, bring them right around. Representative, have, have them come right around. You guys don't mind. Here. Come right around the back here. There's, there's more room. Welcome. Hi, guys. You, come, you can keep coming right around if there's more. <laughs> there you go. Well, Representative Seaworth is here and bringing a group from our district. You want to say a word or two? Sure, this is the Valley School. Um, it's a Montessori school in Pembroke. The kids are, how many actually live in Pembroke? So, a couple. <laughs> they're from around different towns uh, nearby. I think a lot of them are in for Senate Pro Probably, right? yes. Um, and this is also, in, in the Montessori school, they're grouped not in single grade, but the fourth, fifth, and sixth are together. So this is a group of Awesome. Well, welcome. Welcome. I'm, I'm sorry I'm not able to come into the Senate chambers as I traditionally do and, uh, and address you guys, but uh, I wanted to, when Representative Seaworth mentioned you guys were coming, I said, well, bring them into the committee room. We can show them what we, how we actually work rather than just talk about it. So very welcome. Glad to have you here. You enjoying your day? Yep. Yeah, yeah. this will be awesome. Great. Great. This is where we, we hear bills. Somebody tells us about the bill. We can yeah. ask some questions that we have, and they answer them, and then we all vote. So we are actually in the middle of hearing a bill on the Youth Advisory Council, which yeah. uh, it, you guys will be very close to being into that age group soon. So uh, yeah. we have a representative from Derry that's bringing in a bill about making some changes, and the, and the committee is, is hearing about it. So And we have two members of the Youth Advisory Council that are current members that are going to testify on it. So... Welcome, and I'm glad you guys are here. I hope you have a great day. So thanks for coming in. Awesome. awesome. Thank you, Representative Seaworth, for bringing them in. And, uh, and uh, you're welcome to stay for a bit if you want to, but uh, we, uh, we do have a hearing we're in the middle of, so we'll get underway, and you, you are welcome to enjoy it. So Just thanks for coming in. Thank you so much. All right. Senator. Thank you. Which door should we go out? That one back is probably fine. Either one is fine. It doesn't really matter. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> yes. I do know Dan. I only said hello. You look a lot like him. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming in. All right. In Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for all for letting me indulge in that for a few moments. Uh, any further questions? Were you all set on testimony? All right. Well, thank you for testifying. Thank you, and thank you for your time. Senator Waters. This is a familiar face. I think you're usually sitting right over here, though. <laughs> Good morning, and welcome to EDNA. Yeah. 
Good morning, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Senator David Waters, uh, Senate District 4. And um, I appear before you to speak against the uh, amendment that was done to this bill in the House. Um, I've worked with the Legislative Youth Advisory Council for many, many years, and uh, particularly uh, over the past few years with the leadership of it. And I think it's a, really quite an extraordinary uh, body that has brought forth very um, good uh, representation of youth and insight on youth issues and several pieces of legislation that they have weighed in as well over the past few years. And I think it's been very successful. Uh, you will note that the most recent annual report um, that was very thorough was submitted to the governor who approved that report. So I think the governor has recognized the value of this body as well. Um, the Legislative Youth Advisory Council put forward, uh, you know, requested a bit that a bill be put in to help make for a more efficient running of the group. And that's what was what was intro originally introduced. And if you look at it, it, it makes a lot of sense in terms of proving some efficiency, but it retained the basic, um, you know, job description for the group and the issues pretty wide ranging that it, that it should uh, review. I really fear that what this amendment does is very, very seriously damage the uh, effectiveness and the spirit of this advisory council. And I think really contravenes what the governor had hoped that it would, that it would do. Um, I will note a couple of things. In particular, it seems to really rather drastically limit what young people can talk about. And I think that's quite inappropriate. We want them to learn that you know, this is a democracy. They get to talk about things that are of interest to them. The reason we have the council is because it's supposed to be an avenue for this council to give advice to the governor and to us as to what their perspective is, because they are the ones for whom the future has the longest duration. I'm concerned particularly if you go through the list of the original duties that are listed in the original version of 1080 and compare them to what is now in the amended version, you will see the kind of impoverishment of the areas and the elimination of certain areas which we know are of paramount importance to young people. Secondly, I really think the spirit of the council is also violated in terms of the addition of so many um, legislators and the appointment process, which I, I fear in some ways will politicize this in ways that it, it shouldn't be. Not that I have any you know, thoughts about why that might happen, but if you just look at it and you think about it, you can see that what has gone from uh, a kind of a grassroots effort for students to identify themselves and to, to come forward from, from their regions around the state now is going to have involvement, and we and you know we also know how long it can take for appointments to take place by the the Senate President, the House of the Speaker of the House, not for any particular reason, but be, just because we know, you know, we certainly as boards we know that sometimes it can take a long time for those appointments to happen. So I think for those two reasons, I really hope that the committee will look back to the original. That's what the Youth Advisory Council wanted. It's a practical, it's a good bill brought forward, and I, and I just think that a misdirection was taken um, by the amendment in the House. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Do you feel there's an easy fix to this, or should we just go uh, back to the original language, or what? That's your Frankly, I, I think if you were to start with the original bill and see if there's really anything that's wrong with it, I think Maybe there's some changes, but I, I would just say go back to the original bill and take a look, and, and uh, I, I think you'll see a very good and reasonable proposal, and I think that's what you're going to hear from the, from the uh, membership of the folks of, that, of the council who may be here to testify. Okay. I Thank you. We, I know we've got two here. Thank you. For any, any other questions from the committee? Thank right. you very much. Seeing none, thanks for coming in. All right. Rebecca Leak. You guys want to come up together? Or do you want to separate? If you want to, if you're more comfortable together, you're both welcome to. Okay. We each have our individual testimony. All right. So. Good morning. Welcome to EDNA. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Pearl and members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to speak before you. My name is Rebecca Leek. I live in Andover, and I'm a full-time college student pursuing a paralegal degree with Liberty University Online. 
I became a member of the Legislative Youth Advisory Council, also known as, known as LIAC, this past November, after hearing about it from a friend. While I'm a member of LIAC, the council as a whole is remaining neutral on HB 1080, and so I'm speaking for myself as an individual member. LIAC is composed of bright and passionate young people who, are, who desire to aid this great legislature in the drafting and passing of legislation that will help and not hurt the youth of the state. The council provides many wonderful opportunities for these individuals, giving us an opportunity to voice our beliefs and advise the legislature on how we believe the legislation being considered would affect the youth in the state. It further gives us an opportunity to learn more about the passing of legislation and about the current issues in our state. It exposes us to the views and opinions of other young people who we otherwise would have never met and gives us a forum to explore and debate relevant issues. It also gives us the opportunity to meet representatives and senators and to learn from their knowledge and experience. It has given me in particular a reason to be so much more informed on the legislation being considered by the legislature. I've already learned so much from the legislatures I've met and my fellow LIAC, LIAC members and from the research I've done as part of LIAC. While the current text of HB 1080 is quite different from the original bill, there are many good things about it, both from the original text and the amendments. For example, one amendment that was made as recommended by the council was the expansion of the requirements for post-secondary members. The current law requires that post-secondary members attend a New Hampshire post-secondary school or other New Hampshire training or education program or be a member of the New Hampshire workforce. As a full-time college student taking online classes with Liberty University, which is in Virginia, I technically do not meet these requirements. Therefore, I appreciate the amendment that expanded the requirements for post-secondary members. Uh, the consolidation of the appointment process is also an improvement on the current law. And I look forward to working with the youngest representatives from each party whose experience and input, I believe, will, it grad, will add greatly to the council. However, I do have a significant concern with the current text of the bill, namely the number of youth members who may serve on the council. While under the current law there are 19 youth members on the council, the amended bill will lower that number to 13. It is my understanding that this was done to address a perceived lack of applicants. However, this year there has been more than enough applications submitted to fill every seat on the council. Some of these seats are not currently filled because of difficulties working with appointing officers. For example, the Secretary of State's office has refused to appoint individuals from the applicant list sent to all appointers. That issue is already addressed in the bill by the consolidation of the appointment process. Therefore, there is no reason to remove so many seats from our already small council. For the New Hampshire LIAC is indeed small compared to some similar councils. For example, the New Hampshire Governor's Youth Advisory Council on Substance Misuse and Prevention has 21 members. The lowering of the number of seats in the council will greatly hinder the council in the performance of its duties, will lessen the opportunity for members to hear many different points of view, and will deprive more young people of the opportunity to serve on LIAC. The council strives to address many different bills, researching and discussing each one in subcommittees, which will be more difficult to do with fewer members. Moreover, the current bill also requires that council, that quote, council appointments shall, at minimum, represent all 10 counties of New Hampshire. While I fully support the desire for geogra geographic diversity in the council, this means that LIAC would be in violation of statute if, for example, one year we simply cannot recruit a member from every county. The bill also states that the appointments to LIAC shall, quote, represent a wide range of geographic areas and educational experiences. These requirements for diversity are hindered by the lowering of the number of members. Furthermore, I am also concerned by the current bill's requirement that the new council year begin in, on December 1st. The current law states that the council year starts on September 1st, which provides the council members with much needed time to learn about LIAC and their responsibilities and to learn about the government and the legislative process, to transition from the old leadership to the new, and to form subcommittees, all before the bill texts are published. Finally, the change in the council mandate also concerns me. 
as Senator Altshire mentioned, the, law, the current law states that LIAC is, quote, established to examine issues of importance to youth, such as, and it goes on to mention many different issues as she read out. This mandate is broad, allowing the council to adapt and change with time, addressing any issue that concerns the youth of the state, while also giving recommendations to guide the council and suggest what topics they ought to consider. However, the current text of HB 1080 states that LIAC's focus, quote, shall be to identify legislation that affects youth in the areas of education, science and technology, transportation, labor, and substance misuse, unquote. This greatly restricts the council and removes our freedom to address the issues of most importance to us and the other youth in the state that we are representing. Moreover, some of the issues mentioned in the bill do not seem to be as important to young people as other issues not covered. For example, how is science and technology more important than emotional and physical health? How is transportation of more pressing concern than the, to the youth than the foster care system? Therefore, while there are many good portions of this bill, there are also some serious concerns. Thank you again for this opportunity to speak to you. I'm open to questions. Well, thank you. That was great testimony. Any questions from the committee? No, I think you did a great job. I do have one. You mentioned a December 1st date. I was struggling to find that in the bill here. Could you tell me what line that's on? Um, let me see. Uh, page two, line two. Oh, yeah. I knew it was there. I just didn't find it. Thank you. No problem. Further questions from the committee? All right. Seeing none, thanks a lot. You did a great job. Nathan. My name is Nathan Marston, and I reside in the town of Chichester. I am a constituent of this committee's chair, Senator Howard Pearl, and a counselor on the Legislative Youth Advisory Council. This is my first year on the council, and I've already learned much about our state's government, and I'm looking forward to what will be accomplished through LIAC in the future. <coughs> the greatest change that I'm looking forward to from HB 1080 is that the council appointment shall represent all 10 counties in New Hampshire. This will allow for geographic diversity since each member, member will res represent the county that they live in. I'm also pleased to see that we'll study the United States and New Hampshire constitutions during the year and have the youngest representatives from each political party join the council. However, as a post-secondary homeschooled student, I'm greatly concerned that this bill will remove six seats from the council, most of which are post-secondary positions. I'll, this will greatly reduce the chance for diversity in geography and opinion and would also make it harder for homeschool students who are already in the minority to get appointed due to less positions. I greatly appreciate the chance that I've had to serve on this council and would like as many people as possible to get a chance on the council as well through an adequate number of seats. I also fear that the council won't work as well with so many fewer members considering the amounts of research and discussion that we do both in and outside of meetings. Another minor change I would recommend is to move the council starting date back so new council members have a chance to get accustomed to the duties of the council and how it operates before the legislative season starts. Starting in December gives the council no time to prepare. We started in November this year and we're still ill prepared to begin submit testimony in January. I appreciate you taking time to consider this bill that governs LIAC and the New Hampshire youth who are represented through this council. Thank you. Questions from the committee? <coughs> Senator Altshaw. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question. So um, Tell me, could you tell me a little bit about, I've heard both of you talk about um, being concerned with a later start date. What was the conversation like when you were discussing this as a group to get to that date change and how did that, how did that roll out within your group? So um, we were concerned because of the quick jump we had to make to start working on legislation. And if we moved it back several months, it give us a chance to study um, the law that governs LIAC, discuss what our duties and responsibilities are, and get accustomed to what's, what, our, what we're supposed to be doing before we have to start looking at legislation and it's already going through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Follow -up? Uh, yeah, follow-up. Um, so I'm, 
this this may not be the right question for either of you, and I'd, I'd take an answer from either of you. Um, but the application process happens at a time, the current app, as in statute right now, um, appointments happen at a time when it's, uh, everything's in flux. It's at the end of the summer, beginning of the school year, where there's a lot of change in everybody's lives. Would the council be interested in perhaps pushing back the appointment process to the spring so that when if if there were a start date in the fall um it would have eliminated the chaos of who's in who's not who's got their appointment settled and so on and so forth so that everybody would be actually starting at the same time is that um was that part well, of any of your conversations and changing times? I don't think we talked about that. Okay. And my personal opinion would be that would be better because that would allow for, if you have students who are going off to college, it's starting in December, they got several months that they aren't going to be able to fulfill because they're leaving for college. And it allows the switchover to be during like a summer break when yeah. students are about to leave or just starting up. Yeah. Thank you. For the question. Rebecca, did you want to comment on that question as well? You're welcome to come back up if you do. Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, in our council meeting, the start date was not addressed as um, much as the concerns about the lowering of the number of seats or the change of mandate, but it was mentioned and the consensus did seem to be that December was a much too late start date, but no one did think about having appointments in the spring, um, so I'm afraid we can't speak for the council on that. I'm not sure exactly the technicalities of how that would work, but I think that might be a, a chance and idea to look into. When does the council meet next? Uh, next Thursday. I think it's the 11th. So here would be a suggestion from me. Perhaps you can go back to the council maybe and have this conversation with them and then provide some feedback to the committee. It'll be a bit before we're going to work on this bill. Okay. If you'd be, like to do that, that would probably be very helpful for us. We sure yes. appreciate that input. Definitely. Any further questions from the committee? Rep uh, Representative, did you have something you wanted to add? I'll let you come back up too. We're kind of doing this a little informal. <laughs> Thank you uh, for taking my question. Uh, just really briefly, um, the December start date um, was decided upon, from my understanding, because it would reflect um, post-November election, and then the um, legislative appointees would then be um, appointed you know, shortly after in, in December. So I just wanted to give you that um, little piece of seed to think about, too. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? All right. Anybody else that would like to uh, testify on uh, House Bill 1080? All right. Seeing none, we'll close the hearing. And thank you both. You did a great job. If you want us to there we testimony, go. feel free to Next, we have uh, House Bill 1252. <clears throat> Are you going to introduce from Rep. Lekas? Okay. Good morning. Welcome to DNA. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Sherry Gould, Merrimack District 8, and Representative Lekas was sorry he could not attend, so I'm presenting the bill for him. And I'll start with Kwai, uh, Ndilwizi, Sali Gould, Ndai, Manadnock, Wikiak, Massasikam, Nodziabaz, Nodakad, Litbiz, Wogan. And I said, uh, hello, my name is Sherry Gould. I was born in Peterborough. I live in um, a little section of Warren near Lake Massasecum, and um, I am a professional basket maker, and I 
just got to add, and an elected official. <laughs> So I'm here to introduce House Bill 1252. The bill establishes a committee to review the needs of Native Americans in New Hampshire and to review the duties, activities, and composition of the New Hampshire Commission on Native American Affairs. The study committee has very prescribed responsibilities laid out, and, um, in, and, and it ends in November with a report filed and any legislation it finds necessary to, um, depending on the results of the study. In the um, current law for the Commission on Native Affairs, it ends with um, the authority to grant tribal, state tribal status or recognition under Section 104 of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act of 1990. 18 USC Section 1159C3B is reserved solely to the New Hampshire General Court. So um, the main point of establishing the, the committee is to take a look at um, first of all, what are the needs and is the state interested or the general court interested in pursuing the topic? And if so, um, what, if anything, would have to happen with the commission? I, um, there's a committee on committees and commissions that Representative Dolan from our eDNA committee in the House chairs. And I was listening in. Uh, he and I had talked about the Commission on Native Affairs and its importance to Native American people in New Hampshire. And as I was listening in, a, a currently appointed commission member had talked to one of the committee members about her concerns that the Commission on Native Affairs be preserved. There's all these commission committees in these, <laughs> in these sentences, but I'll get through it. Um, and so uh, the committee asked the researcher to look up the study committee that would have happened back in 2010 when the bill was passed to form the Commission on Native Affairs. <clears throat> I knew there was no study committee, and I happened to have a lot of the correspondence that I was able to share, but it taught me the importance of study committees. So a short, brief study committee with clear definitions and a definite end date, even though I know we're all busy trying to, uh, trying to uh, lessen the impact of study committees. Okay, so... I think that's about all I have to say on that. Um, I, in my handout, on the back of my handout uh, of my testimony, I, the, I put a list of some of the opposition we've heard to um, the idea of a study committee or of recognition. And I just did a little like um, answer sheet for you to read. I'm not going to read it all to you. So I'd be happy to take questions if anybody has any. Thank you, Madam Chair. I um, thank you for being here. And I, get, I guess one of the first questions is, how about, and it's more out of curiosity, how many Native Americans are actually citizens in New Hampshire? <laughs> the, um, that's a very loaded question <laughs> in many ways. So in the census records show about one point, I think it's 1.3% of the population of New Hampshire identifies as Native American or some combination thereof in their ancestry. And I haven't looked at those figures for a long time, but the last time I looked, that was the figures we had. It all gets down to, and one of the things in my written testimony that I didn't say is one of the topics here is the legal definition of an Indian or a Native American. And so recognition provides that status of who is legally an Indian. So in terms of that, it would be Native Americans enrolled in recognized tribes, whether they're federal or state. The issues become really, really complex, which is part of why I think a study committee is really helpful to give a small group a, a better understanding. But one of the things in the last few weeks that's come to me, like how do I help my colleagues understand the complexities? And to me, if we look at licensing, the whole topic of licensing, that you're, I mean, it's an oversimplified, and many tribes may tar and feather me <laughs> for trying to oversimplify it that way. But if you look at the concept of you have a group of people, they have certain rights and responsibilities, there's federal laws to consider, what does the state want to do, what, a, what does the group that you're looking to license or recognize need, it's a concept that I think helps people understand. So um, do you see the complexity of how to answer that? But I think that 
percent of the population probably is helpful in terms of looking at where a minority population. So as of right now, the, um, these uh, Native Americans, Indians, they can call themselves that, identify, but there doesn't have to be any proof of genealogy? So, um, when, so recognition is a process whereby that happens, and, and the state determines the criteria, and each state is different. So right now there's like 63 recognized tribes in... Um, 11 different states, I believe it is. I apologize, because this was about the study committee, not about recognition, I didn't brush up on all my facts on um, recognition, but that would come out in part of the study committee's report. So each state has different ways they can do it. Recognition can happen um, in different ways. It can happen through um, uh, resolution. It can happen by proclamation of the governor. It can happen by um, the legislature doing what probably will happen here and setting criteria, um, if it happens here. And, or it can happen um, for state recognition. Those are primarily the ways. So uh, depending on the process and depending on when, what point in time a state looked at the matter. But most recently for us, I'm enrolled in the Nalhegan Band of Abenaki, which um, was recognized by the state of Vermont about a year after we formed the commission. So we formed the commission here in New Hampshire in 2010, and in 2011, Vermont recognized two tribes, and then in 2012, they recognized two more tribes. So there are four Abenaki tribes, and that process in Vermont is really extensive, and it looks at genealogy, it looks at... Um, there's, the, the tribe puts forward what its criteria is for enrollment, and, um, and then that's reviewed by a committee of of um, scholars and experts that had been predetermined. It's, it's a long complex. I'm not going to do it justice um, here for you now. But at any rate, does that answer your question? Sort of. Um, can I follow up? Uh, <laughs> kind of shifting gears, the Native American Commission for the state of New Hampshire, what is their role then at this point if we have to have another study <clears throat> committee? So um, as I stated, the last line of the law for the commission um, states that the commission that the general court has the authority to determine recognition and that the commission does not have that authority so <clears throat> that's the reason why we're looking at a study a separate study committee of the general court so that the general court can look at whether or not um, you know what is the reason why Native Americans need recognition if they do and does the state want to enter into that process Thank you. Further questions from the committee? All right, seeing none, thank you for thank your testimony. You. Senator Waters. <clears throat> Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, good morning again, members of the committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm Senator David Waters, District 4, and I'm here to testify in support of uh, House Bill 1252. And. Uh, I do believe I am the last legislator who was here when we passed House Bill 1610, when I, when I was in the House, um, to get the commission established. And it was, uh, I think I was the sponsor, excuse me, the last sponsor. I was here. I worked with Senator yeah. Fuller-Clark. Yeah. But anyways, I'm the, I'm, I should have been clear because, yes, <laughs> my, my, uh, my senior in the Senate <laughs> certainly was here. And there are a few, and a couple others who was here, too. But um, anyways, you know, and I, I recall very much working on this and the original bill and uh, the extraordinary, if you look at the docket for it, you'll, for House Bill 1610, you'll see an extraordinary process that created the, the commission. And um, so I think that uh, given the, um, that history and also the time that has passed, that it is really timely now to take a look. How, how are things going? A, a lot has changed. Um, with federal policy and uh, within the state itself. And so I think this is an important moment to pause and have a study committee to look, look at it. I think the most important thing here is on lines 19 and 20, where it says review the duties, activities, composition of the New Hampshire Commission on Native American Affairs. Um, the re it, it's done good work. Uh, it has reports that are issued, and this would be an opportunity 
to, to take a look and review um, and then to talk with all involved about how has it gone? Is this something that we might propose and bring forward here? I think above that, what is important is, of course, um, have discussions with Native American communities. That's what we legislators should do. And I think it's particularly important in, in, this, in this case because of the self-determination of that community. Um, secondly, because if you look at the enabling legislation statutes for the commission, you'll see that it has involvement of various state um, offices or their designees. And so because the legislature at that time ch choose to involve the agencies in that way, I think it'd be good to, to, to get their perspective on, on things. And I think we'll hear some real advice from them about ways, in fact, to reconfigure that relationship. And as was... Um, you know, qu queried by uh, Senator Gendro, I, I do think it's time for us to look at the issues of state recognition or other acknowledgement. Now, we use the word acknowledgement now in the statute, the existing statute, and that was a very carefully chosen word um, because of the status of uh, Native American recognition that is determined by federal law. And New Hampshire is one of those states that does not have a federally recognized uh, tribe. And that has a lot of implications. Uh, it has implications for the ways in which Native people in this state uh, interact with the state and federal government. And uh, it, I, I, the, I think it's been long understood that the um, possibility of federal recognition of a Native tribe in New Hampshire is, is highly unlikely, especially based on um, determinations have been made for some other uh, groups in, in New England. So that in that case, um, and at the time when we established the commission, that was understood and made very clear in the debate on the House 4 in particular. Um, but there, it, it may be time for us to look at, given that, that, then would it be advisable to look at some form of state recognition or acknowledgement? And many states have done this around the country. Um, and I think that's a particularly important because the kind of evolution of where federal policy is. I'll speak to my own experience as when I was at University of New Hampshire for about a decade, I was the um, university officer for the Na Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act. Um, and we had to uh, have such a, a position because in our archaeological co collections, we had um, grave goods, uh, remains, sacred items, and so forth that had been taken um, from archaeological digs and were required under NAGPRA to return those to, to um, the tribes. Now, what, co what complicated that for New Hampshire is because it was not a, a recognized, federally recognized tribe. So we ended up in our reporting to the Department of Interior having to um, go through federally recognized tribes in other states, Maine and Massachusetts, who had historical interactions with native people in, in, uh, in, in New Hampshire. Um, NAGPRA law is in the process of being changed, and I think there are opportunities uh, because we still have uh, items from graves and other things to, to repatriate. Uh, and so I think that it's a time to take a look Two, whether that process of doing the right thing about those remains could be assisted by this. And then secondly, I, I think that um, there will be opportunities to enrich the relationship of the state and its agencies uh, to Native peoples by some look at the potential for state recognition or acknowledgement, which could help set up some of those, those processes as well. Uh, it, it, this is this is going to be complicated. It's going to be difficult. Um, state boundaries really have very little to do, particularly in New England, with the historical presence or range of, of Native peoples. Uh, and so that's always complicated. The, the kind of colonial legacy is that we've created these boundaries where, where they did not necessarily exist. So it's, it's complicated, but I, I do think this is an important moment to have that included in the study committee as well. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Questions from the committee? All right, seeing none, appreciate you coming in. Oh, oh I, think. I just had, Senator a, Carson. I just had a quick question. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, Senator. Um, I remember we an EDNA years ago, we worked on this, and it was very complicated, very touchy, because 
every person that came in had a very different opinion. And so it was difficult to get consensus. Um, and I'm looking at the duties and I don't see anything about consulting with a historian of Native American history. I think that might be very helpful to start off with getting a historical background because you've mentioned it. I know this is something that you have studied. It's also something that I have studied as a, an early American historian, but it might be interesting to ask the, the study commission or the committee to get a historian's perspective of um, Native Americans in New England because I completely agree boundaries our, bo our boundaries are very, very different. And I think maybe getting that historical background would be very helpful. And that's just a thought. Th th thank you, um, Senator. And, you know, being uh, of, the, of the same kind of academic persuasion as, as you are in many ways, um, I, I can understand that, that thought. My hesitation about it is this, is that I think that Native communities' histories, very much the communities feel that they are the best authorities and in possession of their own histories. And they've had, you know, frankly, as, as you would know from your own studies, a long periods of time in which um, non-Native historians and for various reasons have, have, have presented pictures that were in, inaccurate or biased or otherwise un, ne, not necessarily fully informed. So I'm... I, I, I pause because I think about, okay, let's say that was in there. Whom would, whom would be chosen? And how would that process of choosing such a person? I think it'd be, it might be a little more um, useful if you, you know, because I understand what you're, what you're getting at, is to say that discussion with Native American communities, and you might have a phrase, who can um, help educate the study committee on matters of Native history in New Hampshire. So something like that might be helpful, but I, I'm just, you can see how I'm kind of yeah. a little nervous about mm -hmm. selecting somebody from who might not be uh, from the Native community. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Further questions? All right, seeing none. Thank, thank you. you. I think it says Madeline. I'm going to let you do the rest of the name. <laughs> You're from the Mount Kiyosage Indian Museum. Come on up. Please introduce yourselves. Good morning. I am here uh, along with Mary Nagel. Mary Nagel. I'm from Alton Bay, New Hampshire. Could you give us your name, too? Pardon? Give, could you give us your full name? My full name? Yes. Yes. Madeline Goslin Wright. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and we are both here representing the Mount Kearsage Indian Museum in support of HB 1252. Uh, first, just a little about me. I am a citizen of the Nalhegan Abenaki tribe. I was appointed by the governor and served as a member of the New Hampshire Commission on Native American Affairs, and I currently serve on the Mount Kearsage Indian Museum Board of Trustees. The Mount Kearsage Indian Museum supports efforts to better understand the needs and the aspirations of Native Americans in New Hampshire and beyond. Our hope is that any committee looking at these matters would be allocated adequate opportunities and resources to complete a careful and thorough study. Uh, I thank you for your time and for your consideration. Thank you. Did you want to speak too? No, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm also on the Board of Trustees with the Mount Kearsage Indian Museum. And she's here with me. For support. All right. Sarah. Support me. <laughs> Questions from the committee? Mm -hmm. All right. Seeing none, thank you both for coming in. And thank you very much. So we have. Uh, Four or five other folks that have signed in in support. Anybody that else that wishes to speak? Did you want to speak? Come on up. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. From sure. my neighboring district, we live in Gilmanton. Okay. That was my wife, Mary. Um, I'm Representative Dave Nagel. Um, I wasn't going to speak, but I kind of, the more I listened, I felt the need to somewhat to answer one of the questions that was asked. Um, in addition to being a representative, I'm also a physician. I began my career with the Native Health Service in Alaska about 40 years ago, which was probably the most transforming experience of my life. Um, it's always been a big part of my life since then. My wife, as you know, now is on the board at the Indian Museum. Um, we're also uh, volunteers for the Native American Community Services of Western New York, which is our hometown. Um, about a year or two ago, we became very interested in the whole concept of um, Native health care in New Hampshire. And it became very troubling to me that in states all over the country, natives have access to care. For example, in Alaska, if you're a native, you have free health care. Here, um, if, for example, if you move from Alaska to here, you kind of give that up. And so we were looking at, like, what kind of strategies, what kind of things do you have access to here? What can we do that we're not doing now? So we put together a committee. We ended up publishing a 40-page report that I have on my laptop here. If you want, I'd be happy to share it. I mean, they basically outlined the concerns were about roughly 200 respondents, and they told, said what they're not getting that they want access to. The reason why I think this committee that we're looking at right now is in addition to all these other needs, I think health care needs is really important, and that's what I wanted to stress, but that's actually not why I wanted to get up here. You had asked a question about numbers, and I wanted to give you those numbers because we actually have that in our report. But... Um, there are 3,150 individuals in New Hampshire who identify as American Indian, Alaska Native alone. I mean, that's the only thing that they, they identified. There's 384 individuals who identify as Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, and there's another 8,068 who identify as a combination of multi-ethnic backgrounds. Um, and I think that, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I just wanted to share that information and, and um, we really need to look at health care in these folks, as we do in other groups as well. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. <clears throat> Senator Carson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Representative. Good morning. Do you know if um, the sponsors of this bill have reached out to the existing commission to even discuss with them this bill? That I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, yeah, they, uh, Sherry, uh, Representative Gould could probably answer that better than me, but. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Further questions? I got an email that said they didn't. All right, thank you. Thanks. Anybody else that would like to speak? Come on up if you want to. We'll give you another minute. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to um, represent uh, Senator Carson, just to um, answer your question, we did reach out, and um, Carlos Cardova is one of the appointed commission members, and we were working together. The issue that was happening for the commission, it's been an ongoing issue, and I heard a little bit of it when um, the Youth Council bill before this was being presented. The issue has been getting the seats all filled on the commission and um, having a quorum I think, and I don't know what the other issues are because I'm not currently appointed. I was formally appointed to the commission for two terms and was chair and vice chair and chair. But at, um, currently we did reach out and we did share the bill. I've heard it said that they didn't ever see the bill. And I, mm -hmm. I really don't understand how that happened because um, it was shared. And But my best understanding is that it was the lack of a quorum and the inability to have a legal meeting that was preventing um, that from happening. May I? Yes. Thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. I know that I've received email from members of the commission who have said, we haven't seen this, we don't know what it's about, they didn't talk to us, so um, maybe we can get some clarification on that. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you, Representative. Anybody else? All right, seeing none, we're gonna close the hearing. Oh. Senator, turn your mic on, please. Thank you. Before you close the hearing, thank you. Um, that, that was almost close. You were quick. I, was I know. I know. Um, 
With, without objection, may we please may please submit the testimony that was given to us um, by Vicki Blanchard, Debbie Bazin, Dosti, and Ann Jennison um, into the into the uh, hearing record. Absolutely. Yeah. No, great. No Thank you. Thank you. All right. With that, we're going to close the hearing on House Bill 1252. Crew is here. Come on up. We'll uh, open the hearing on House Bill 1328. Good morning. Welcome to EDNA. Good morning. Nice to be back. Seems to be on. This is like my second home. <laughs> <coughs> so well, you're always welcome here. <laughs> I'm introducing House Bill 1328. Uh, I was asked to put this in from some members of the EMS community who told me they were not defined as essential personnel or essential uh, mm -hmm. service providers. So during our pandemic, I'm sure we all kind of remember that, um, they were hindered by not being in that, from what I'm told, like as a firefighter, we were free to move around when nobody else could. Um, and some other things like that, they were technically not supposed to because they weren't covered under this as well. So they asked to be lumped into the uh, emergency service providers and, and we did a nice job uh, with this definition, kind of lumped in everybody and then labeled them as, as such. The other thing about this bill, I got contacted yesterday by uh, Health and Human Services that they want to add something to this uh, and amend it and ask me if I was open to that, and I am. And I'm sure they can speak to exactly how they want to amend it. Amend it. They want to add some more uh, people that they were going to put in a bill next year for, and they thought this would be a great um, avenue to do it this year, and I was okay with that. So that'll end it. Do you have language that you want to add? or are they, I they believe present? they do. Okay. Uh, or they're working with uh, the AG to do it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Representative. Questions from the committee? Seeing none, thanks for Thank coming you. in. Abby Rogers and John Williams, you signed up together. Do you both want to come up together or just Abby? <laughs> Uh, good morning, just me. John's in All another right. committee, sorry. Uh, my name is Abby Rogers. I'm the Legislative Liaison for the Division of Public Health Services. And the department's in support of this bill. Um, what Representative Pro represented yesterday is correct. Uh, the department is looking to make a legislative change to increase liability coverage, perhaps for volunteer emergency management volunteers. And this is the exact statute that we would have to put that in. So I. Uh, we have um, some information and, and uh, content that's being reviewed by the DOJ at the moment, so I understand that the chair might be amenable to holding the bill until we are able to get some further information um, yeah. on that. And uh, as I appreciate the sponsor's willingness to allow us to potentially do that uh, change in his bill if it works. Sure, thank you. Uh, we won't be accepting any house bills for probably about two weeks anyway. Okay. So um, if that time frame works out for you. Perhaps you could get some information to us within that time frame. That would be great. Thank you. Maybe, maybe we can look at that one then. Perfect. Thank All you. Right. Questions from the committee? All right. Seeing none. Thank you. Uh, is Rep. McGuire here? I don't see her. Je All right. Representative Grody? No. Uh, on this bill, she had signed up to speak. Oh, okay. I think not. Okay. Well, it, we're all set if you don't. Okay. We're all set. I just, she was on the list and I was kind of holding it, looking for her. And, okay. All right. Anybody else that would like to speak on this? Uh, we have one other folk that's, well, you signed in in support, Rep. Grody. Uh, no? All right. Seeing none, we'll close the hearing on House Bill 1328. Oh. Introduce the next one for Carol. Okay, we'll open up the the hearing on House Bill 1387, and we'll uh, recognize Rep. Grota to introduce it. 
Thank you. Um, my name is Jackie Grota. I'm a state representative for the towns of Rye, Greenland, Rockingham District 24, and I'm here to introduce House Bill 1387. And this was a um, bill that was submitted to our committee um, and um, was described appropriately as a cleanup bill for the state building codes, revisions that have occurred in the past years. And um, Mr. Sherman from the Building Code Review Board is here to present the changes similarly to how he presents them at the EDNA hearing. All right, so you'd probably like me to call him next, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, questions from the committee? See none, thank you. All right, Phil, you're on. <laughs> she set the bar high now. Our expectations are way up there. Good morning, welcome to EDNA. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm happy to walk through each of the points on this briefly. I have the RSAs that are referenced, so if we need to dig in a little bit, just uh, uh, let me know. Uh, I guess you've all got a copy of the bill in front of you. Uh, the first part of this simply takes the currently required accessibility certification and requires it to be issued to the uh, governmental authority, typically the building official. Um, right now, it actually goes to the owner, and then the building official is left sort of chasing things around to get a copy of it to, to see whether that RSA was complied with. So this is a review of accessibility, mm -hmm. handrails and restrooms and things like that uh, that's already required to be done at the completion of a project. Uh, no real cost associated with that. Uh, the second point, uh, our, our board consists of 17 members, 16 uh, come from what I'll call constituent groups, plus myself as the chair, uh, representing the Commissioner of Public Safety. The Mechanical Engineering uh, uh, Board, or the engine, Board of Engineers, who appoints three engineers, structural, electrical, mechanical, we're suggesting that mechanical uh, be changed to allow for the uh, uh, use of a fire protection engineer. In recent years, there are more fire protection engineers in the state. Uh, interestingly enough, both the state fire marshal and the chair of the Building Code Review Board are fire protection engineers, uh, and we think that they provide a valuable input in that many of us uh, have spent our time dealing with the various codes uh, through our careers. So uh, the uh, Board of Fire Control now allows for one, and, and we would request that also. Uh, not eliminating mechanical engineer if, if that's the person who, who was appointed by the, by the board. Um, in terms of the alternate members, we found out that, that while they are appoint, they're nominated by the constituent groups appointed by the commissioners, uh, unlike uh, the primary members who have a three-year term, there was no expiration date for alternates, and we actually find one who had been deceased, and nobody knew that. So this just puts a clock on it where every three, three years we kind of check in and see if you're still alive, I guess. Was he, was he still Pardon me for the humor, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it just, it's a glitch. Uh, from the beginning of the state building code, there was a desire that we track one addition back on the model codes. So the 2024 IBC and so forth are currently out on the street. We are in the ratification provisions for the 2021 series. Uh, no intent to change that. Because of some glitches with calendars, uh, we request that uh, that two-year delay, which and, and the effect of that was to put us one edition behind, be changed to one year. We have no, no sense that that's going to change the way the sort of rubber hits the road. Uh, but for instance, this year, the residential code and the energy code were subject to a bunch of appeals. They have been delayed in publishing. And if we stick with this two-year thing, we're going to wind up with codes that don't align with the publishing uh, section. We actually started off getting rid of that requirement, and the electrical folks uh, convinced us that they have a need to see their code out on the street for a year. 
the electrical code, I think, is, is made up of many more sort of fine details than many of the other codes, and seeing how that stuff plays out in other jurisdictions is useful. So we're happy with the, with the amendment that changed that to one year and would recommend that that be, uh, be continued. Uh, the Energy Code Compliance Form, which again has been around for a long time, currently is prescribed by rule. We're asking that it be prescribed by amendment. Um, again, at the risk of some humor, the legislature can move faster than the people who approve rules. So we have a problem in that this form needs to be adopted essentially when the code goes into effect, not some number of months later when it works its way through GELCAR and all the other pieces of, of getting a rule changed. So we, we just would provide that form as an amendment basically and then get it ratified like everything else in the code. Uh, and then the last, well, the last uh, addition, where we talk about the electricians, the home inspectors, and the mechanical licensing board and us hearing appeals, no change at all. All that does is put the labels for those boards into RSA so somebody doesn't have to go see what 319C says. Uh, so that's just, just uh, editorial. Then on the repealing, number one on 155A2V, uh, v, yeah, Roman numeral V. Uh, that is a duplicate of 155A3, Roman numeral 1. So we're just taking that out because it duplicates things. The section on biomass boilers was put in for one state project. It's now in the codes. It's in the model codes. There's no dispute on that, and there really is no requirement or, or no need for an RSA to tell us to write an amendment to allow for these. They're allowed by all the codes anyway. Uh, likewise, with log structures, that's an RSA that requires us to adopt a substandard on log structures. It's embedded in the model codes now. There's no dispute, it's just there. So no need for an RSA on that. And then lastly, uh, 155A10, uh, Roman numeral 4E is again a duplicate that allows us to hear appeals from local boards of appeal. That shows up in, in 155A, Roman numeral 2B. So it's just cleaning up some, uh, some typo stuff essentially. So, that's where we are. Thank you for the clarification and all of that. Um, I do find it interesting that Carol McGuire put this bill in and she chairs GELCAR because typically, typically uh, GELCAR is known to be more nimble than the legislature, but I, not in this case. I think it's more the sequencing of things yeah. uh, where we need to have that form available when people out on the street have to meet the code. So by putting it in as amendment, everything hits the street at the same time. Um, okay, thank you. Did you have a question? I do, Chair. Um, I have a couple of questions, if sure. I could. Yeah. So, um, just starting from the beginning, I see in Section 2 where you mentioned sort of introducing the fire protection engineer, just looking at the other members of the board, you know, there will still be a structural engineer, a mechanical engineer, an electrical engineer. Um, but can you... Can you just talk a little bit more about fire protection engineers? Are they are they sort of truly interchangeable with mechanical engineers? And I'm asking as a spouse of a mechanical engineer, I would get in trouble if I just dismissed them as not necessary. <laughs> right. So a, a couple of things, uh, not necessarily related. One, uh, the Board of Engineers had a lot of trouble finding mechanical engineers to okay. serve on our board. That I, position I sat vacant that. for a few years. Sure. Uh, and in fact, we kind of had to go break some arms to get somebody in there, which mm -hmm. is working out okay now. Mm -hmm. That person happens to also be a fire protection engineer. So we're behind every rock. Um, FPEs generally, uh, and I'll speak to the kind that are in consultants, there are others that are in insurance or they're designing sprinkler systems or things like that. Mm -hmm. But those of us who are more general consultants tend to spend our lives in the, in the codes where mechanical engineers have a, a more of a focus on their part of the, uh, their part of the design. Okay. So this does not prohibit mechanical engineers. It just says we have one position and pick either or. Uh, and it's up to the Board of Engineers who, who can mediate that. Uh, okay. Yeah, just because I would think that would be sort of an important expertise on the board. Um, and then my second question, it relates to sort of the very last thing you said about appeals. There's 
a lot of moving pieces on building related decisions and appeals this year. So could you just sort of restate the cleanup related to appeals that you mentioned? On the part very, that's being repealed? The end of your testimony, yes. That's just a duplicate. There's just two okay. sections in the code that say we hear appeals from local boards of appeal. Okay. So there's no material change to anything. It's just printed in the RSA twice. Literally twice. Yep. Got it. Well, that should not raise any concern from my end. I'm saving <laughs> ink. <laughs> Further okay. questions? No, sir. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Steve, did you want to speak? You're not on the list, but. All right. Anybody else? I'm sorry. He's uh, chairs the building, state building code. Uh, what is he at? Phil, what's the actual state building code? Review board. Thank you. Yeah, we go. Sorry, I had cramped up there for a minute. All right, anybody else that would like to testify on House Bill 1387? Seeing none, we'll close the hearing. I don't know where Senator Carson went. She had to make a quick call, and I told her to hurry back. I want to go into exec session real quick, but uh, so we're gonna, we'll take a two-minute recess and see if we can get Senator Carson back. Okay.
right, we are coming back out of recess. I'll look for a motion to go into executive so session. Moved second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, we've got one bill left that we can exec, which is, where'd it go? I lost it. Senate Bill 481, and I want to ask, uh, invite Grant to come up and address the committee here with some information that he uh, got from me that I asked him to, and thank you, Grant, for your hard work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Grant Bossie, Deputy Chief of Staff of the New Hampshire Senate. Following the discussion of uh, state holidays last week, uh, Senator Pearl gave me some homework. I walked right across the street, uh, met with Commissioner Arlinghouse, uh, and we discussed state holidays. So um, I have an email from him. I also did a Venn diagram. Uh, New Hampshire <laughs> defines state holidays in two places. One is RSA 288-1 which this bill would amend by adding Juneteenth to the list of official state holidays. The second place is in the collective bargaining agreement with state employees. That is the one that controls whether these days are days off. Uh, and as you can see from uh, the visual aid, these largely but do not completely intersect. There are official state holidays that are not paid days off for state employees. There are days that I get to sit home and get paid that are not official state holidays, such as the day after Thanksgiving. Uh, discussing with Commissioner Arlinghouse, if the intent of the committee is to add a paid day off, that would require an amendment. Uh, Commissioner Arlinghouse is concerned that superseding collective bargaining uh, might have other complications. He would want to bring in the Attorney General. So uh, given that uh, crossover is next week, this committee has all sorts of options. Uh, you could amend the bill. I would suggest that that would, you probably don't have time to do it today. You'd want to do it either on the floor or on the house. You could pass it as is. You could kill it interim study it at all the other regular options. But to clarify, the bill as it currently stands, in the opinion of the Department of Administrative Services, would not add a paid day off for state employees. Thank you, Grant. I appreciate it. Any questions for Grant? I have a question for you. Yes, Senator, Senator Parker Chairman. Spoke. Yes, um, thank you for your lovely Venn diagram. This is incredibly helpful. Um, I, if you recall last week, I did bring an amendment that would have moved the effective date out, the purpose of which was to allow time for a collective bargaining around whether the state holiday would be included as a paid day off or not. So my intent as sponsor is to have the recognition of the day as an important day. I think it's up to the collective bargaining units to um, determine that. So I guess my question to you is, um, would you like to express any opinion on whether we adopt the amendment I proposed or not? <laughs> I do not have opinions on policy matters, Senator. You okay. Uh, moving the effective date <laughs> would, not cha would change whether it were an official state holiday in 2024. Mm -hmm. It would not affect collective bargaining. You could... Uh, the, the union and the governor's negotiating team could take this up. And for instance, the last time uh, the bargaining, uh, the holidays were changed, I believe Columbus Day was dropped as a paid day off and uh, employee, we got an extra floater. We got an extra floating holiday. Mm -hmm. So whether you put it into statute, what the effective date is, would not, might provide some guidance to that. Mm -hmm. Bargaining, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't be controlling that would be, mm -hmm. and it would not be necessary. So mm -hmm. either way, uh, making the effective date sixty days after passage or mm -hmm. or upon passage or July first. Obviously, if you make make it July first, it wouldn't be in effect this June, but that would not directly influence uh, what goes into the next contract. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? No, sir. All right. Thank you, Grant. Thank I you. Appreciate your hard work and uh, the clarity that you provided to the committee. Mr. Chair, I'd like to move on to pass. I'll second. Further discussion from the committee? I would just like to thank the committee for the hard work on this important <clears throat> issue. I know there are many in my district and elsewhere in New Hampshire that will appreciate our work on this. Senator General, did you want to speak? Yeah, Pardon? just, you know, and I appreciate um, Senator Perkins Coker bringing this forth. Um, you know, and just, I've got a very different district. <laughs> and it's not that we don't want to celebrate. Uh, there, this was a big event. Um, but I, I think from my district's perspective, the thought of having to pay yet for another day off um, did not set well the eventual 
um, paying for another day off. The, the thought of being able to just set it aside as a day of celebration, absolutely. Just like I had mentioned before, the Pollyanna Day, which is local, but it is now recognized statewide as the second Saturday in January, or June, but it's not a paid day off, a state paid day off. Same with the Old Man of the Mountain. Um, that was a huge event. It wasn't our fault his face fell off, but we are memorializing it, but we don't pay our state employees for that, um, that holiday. But it is a time of memory, and I would like to see that with the Juneteenth um, versus putting a uh, pay payment to it. So with that, I do have to um, oppose ought to pass, but I, I do really appreciate, because there's a lot of um, events out there that are worthy of um, recognition. So. For the discussion. All right, seeing none, did you, you're okay with not putting the amendment on? Correct. All right, I just want to make sure I gave you that option. Thank okay. you. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? No. All right, the motion passes 4-1. <laughs> would you like to take this out? I would love to. All right, Senator Perkins Coker will take it out. So, Mr. Right. Chairman, before we conclude, yes. um, let's congratulate each other and thank each other for getting through all the Senate bills. Senate so that's right, that's right. That's one. Thank you. Thank you. thank you all for your hard work. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Thanks for your leadership. Just a reminder that we have an 11 o'clock tour scheduled with the State Archives today for those that want to attend. And uh, I know she's very excited to host us. So. I have to take a rain check, but I appreciate it. Yes, anyone that would like to can turn. Do you have your wife's stuff? No, I have mine. Ah. I have more seats than she does. Okay. Is it right. covered in syrup inside? It or? is not. Well, there is syrup like inside, but it's not covered. Just <laughs> <laughs> All right, for, I'll take a motion to come out of the exec. So moved. So moved. Second. moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, and with that, our work is done for today. And again, I appreciate all of you. And uh, as I make just a quick update, next week we'll have um, OPC, OPLC bills scheduled, which I have to get to Kevin, which, and then the following week we'll be f focusing more on Nurse Practice Act bills that we have coming. And my hope and belief is that we will be able to start exactly two weeks from today. So I'm, my intention is to schedule a little bit shorter hearing day on that day, and we'll go right into executing some bills. So if there are bills that you want to do amendments on or things that you want to work on and have them ready for that day, uh, my hope is to get through as many as we can and get them out of here, hopefully on consent. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Thank you. Take care. That's it.